Welcome back, everybody. I'd like to give a special shout out to any new viewers. If you would like more information regarding small groups, submit a prayer request, or partner with us in giving, please visit us at newarqpc.info. Today, Brother Moss will be giving the message of forgiveness of Calvary. As we hear the message, let us keep in mind of Jesus' great love and forgiveness. Welcome to the digital campus of Newark United Pentecostal Church. We're glad to have you with us this evening as we introduce a new week of study on the subject of forgiveness. But before I get to tonight's study, I'd like to take a moment to talk about our digital campus. All of us are experiencing varying degrees of frustration as we eagerly anticipate getting together again for in-person services. Now, several other places are already gone back to holding the traditional type of service. Some of those have had to reverse course when the virus spread among them and sometimes to their contacts in the wider community. Some areas of the country have not been hit as hard as this mid-Atlantic region. Even some in this area have been able to get back together. Their situations are often different than ours. Size of the building, the relative size of the congregation, and other factors vary from what we are facing. Your pastoral team is constantly reevaluating our situation and striving mightily to get us back together at 73 Salem Church Road, but to do so wisely and safely without doing more harm than good. We've had at least two cases of COVID-19 in this congregation. Both survived and are doing well but it did not spread among us and cause the loss of life seen in other places because we are meeting on the digital campus. We have church six nights a week with kids Bible night, small groups, connect and community gatherings, memorable moments, 
a virtual songbook that is constantly growing and a rich, deep archive available 24 seven. The building is closed, but we are having church because we are church. The church is not shut down. The church, as I've said before, is deployed. Now, deployed is a military terminology. In the King James Version, the title Lord of Hosts is found 244 times and Lord God of Hosts another 40 times. The Lord of Sabaoth in James 5 and 4 means exactly the same thing. It's just a difference of translation for some reason. In the New Living Translation, the term hosts is translated heaven's armies. Our God is the commander in chief, not only of heaven's armies, but of the church militant that is currently involved in a battle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. In any army, tactics change from era to era. Once armies clashed with multitudes of men armed with swords and shields, then later guns and cannonade took the field to be joined by aircraft still later. During World War II, my father was a sergeant with the Army Air Corps. He repaired B-17s and got them in shape to return to the war. He never left the continental United States, but he was still active in the war effort. He was a soldier. It would be difficult to convince a soldier sitting at a computer in Florida, flying a drone somewhere in the Middle East, that he or she was not in the military and contributing to the protection of our country. Just because a part of the effort has become digitally based does not change the fact that a battle is ongoing. Though we are operating through the internet, we're still preaching the same powerful word of God. Prayer still prevails against the powers of darkness and opens doors of communication to hear direction from on high. We're still in the battle using the same spiritual sword as in days gone by. God is still on the throne and scheduled to call his people home at the appointed time. Nothing eternal has changed. So, Christian soldier, let's soldier on. Now, this week we are looking at several facets of the jewel of forgiveness. It's my pleasure and honor to point out to you the brightest gleam from this gem, the forgiveness of Calvary. In introducing this very crucial topic, I will probably venture into territory that's covered by other messages this week. And rather than seeing it as redundant, please count it as the voice of multiple witnesses. Our key scripture for this lesson is, will be Luke 23, verse 34, and I'm using the New Living Translation. The scripture reads, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. 
This is, of, of course, Jesus' prayer from the cross for forgiveness. Surely it was not just for those soldiers throwing dice at the foot of the cross, but rather a universal plea for forgiveness for all of us who don't really understand what we are doing or have done. Jesus gave some strong teaching about forgiveness. His, this plea for forgiveness from a position where he was suspended between heaven and earth was a forceful demonstration of practicing what he had preached. In what we call the Lord's Prayer and a following explanation found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 12 through 15, Jesus tied our being forgiven to our forgiveness of others. This is repeated in Luke chapter 11 and verse number 4. He re-emphasized this principle in Mark 11, 25, when he said, But when you are praying, first forgive anyone, notice this terminology, you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins too. Interesting. We've got a problem with them. We need to uh, forgive them for whatever it is that caused our grudge. As is typical with many of us, Simon Peter in Matthew 18 tried to find the outer limits of what was really required in this realm of forgiveness. Uh, it's been said that the Pharisees required that a person be forgiven three times. That was all that was necessary. So if that be so, then Peter's question about forgiving seven times doubled that and then added another uh, to the accepted standard of the day. I'm sure that he probably considered his offer of seven times to be very liberal. But Jesus blew that argument out of the water with his reply that seven times would be enough, but only if it were repeated 70 times in a day, in a single day. Obviously, Jesus was not encouraging everyone to keep a daily tally sheet on each person one met to determine when it was permitted for you to stop forgiving them. In fact, it was after this exchange that Jesus told the parable of the two debtors. The first owed the king so much that it would, it would take all the wages of a, a laboring man without taking out anything for living expenses or for taxes, just his, his whole paycheck, if you will, over a period of thousands of years to pay the debt. Yet, the king forgave the whole debt. You know, of course, that in the story, this man would not forgive the debt of someone who owed him a mere pittance in comparison. When a little later in Luke 17 and, and 4, Jesus said, uh, speaking to his disciples, even if that person wrongs you seven times a day, and each time, turns again to ask forgiveness. You must forgive. 
When he said that, it may have been a not so subtle reminder to his followers of his pre previous teachings about seven and 70. Matt Tatro, who helped with the research for this message, reminded me of a, a Bible story which brought in turn another verse to my mind. I thought of, uh, Matt mentioned the story of Joseph and his brothers, and I thought of Amos 3 and 7, which says, Indeed, the sovereign Lord never does anything until he reveals his plans to his servants, the prophets. Now, before Jesus declared that blanket forgiveness to the entire world, indeed, before he ever arrived to teach the necessity and blessing of forgiveness, the prophet Moses wrote the story of Joseph, whose spirit of forgiveness foreshadowed it left a pattern. It left an, an image, an example of what was coming at Calvary. Let me give you the story from Genesis chapter 50, and I'll begin with verse number 16. So they, and this is speaking of his brothers, sent this message to Joseph. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. I think here I hear a guilty conscience speaking. But when, G when Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. And Joseph replied, Don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly. There we see the, the evidence, the fruits, the expression of Joseph's forgiveness. Mariana Sierra also helped with the research and put this act of forgiveness from Calvary into a, a numerical perspective. She informed me and checks out that there are some 7 billion, 800 million people alive today. Now, if each person committed only one sin a day, that would mean that Jesus' offer of forgiveness would be extended nearly 8 billion times a day. That's billion with a B. But how many people commit only one sin a day? So just multiply. Other research projects estimate that to this point, there have been in the neighborhood of 100 billion people who have lived on this earth. Mind-boggling just to contemplate the, the vast number of sins that that many people have committed. 
The number may approach or even exceed a Google, and that's spelled G-O-O-G-O-L. It's, it's not a search engine. It's a number one followed by 100 zeros. That's a pretty big number. When we ponder the fact that all of the sins of all of the people of all of the ages met at that old rugged cross, we can begin to get an inkling of the power and extent of the atonement and its forgiveness. The sheer magnitude of the burden and the depth of, as expressed in Isaiah 1 and 18, the crimson and scarlet of sin is inconceivable to, to mere human understanding. The absolute horror of complete purity taking on such a weight of utter depravity helps us understand what Jesus was really describing when what he was about to do when he commanded us in Luke 6 and 27, I say unto you which here, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. He had nails in his hands. His back had been scourged until bones were most likely laid bare. and His intestines may have been oozing out through the the ripped muscle tissue, but he forgave. Just a few moments ago, while Caleb was on his way over here to do this video for me, I remembered a song and a story. I may not have all the details right. In fact, I'm not sure that I have much of them right, but I can tell you the story as I heard it. It's about a song, and the story goes back several decades to a time when there was much turmoil in our country, and there were church bombings, lots of terrible, horrible, sinful things going on that were covered, if you will, at Calvary. But <clears throat> there was a church that was bombed. It was not just uh, damaged, it was destroyed. The pastor, an African-American man, was out of town at the time flew back, got there as quickly as he could. When he arrived at the property, there were some of the ladies of the church who were picking through the, the rubble, trying to salvage what they could. The pastor stood in, in the midst of all of this destruction, the raw evidence of hatred in somebody's heart. And he, being as human as the rest of us, testified later, I wanted to kill somebody. As he looked about him and saw the, the, the ruination of, of all of the many years of work and the loss of of a place for them to gather and to worship God and to sing his praises. He would, something rose up within him that would probably rise up in me and in you. And in the midst of that dust and rubble and destruction, he also testified that he felt the Lord speaking to him. And he fell to his knees, 
with the song. And I have the, I got on the internet and, and found the first verse of, of that song. And it was just simply these words. I don't remember trudging up a rugged hill with a cross upon my back. I don't recall a thorny crown being placed upon my brow now that I look back. I've never been spit upon, ridiculed, wounded in my side. Life's no bed of roses, but still I am alive. I've got a long way to go to be like my Lord. Now, whether that's the origin of the song or whether it's just something that has been made up and passed along and I heard it somewhere along the way, the thoughts there. He's our gold standard of forgiveness. The crown of thorn, nails, the spear to the side, the hatred of those, the, the spittle from those who should have been lauding him and worshiping him and welcoming him. And he said, Now, I have known of parents, not mine, thank the Lord, but I have known of parents who, when punishing their children, would say something along the line of, if I don't know what this spanking is for, I'm sure you do. Unfortunately, as wrong as that parent may have been in the punishment, child very likely had done something worthy of some kind of chastisement. When we're punished unfairly, we can usually console ourselves that if we will, that the fact of the matter is that we got away with other things. Jesus was not that way. He did no sin. Everything that happened to him was because of what others had done. The apostle referred to this in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. Verse 21, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you now, and you must follow in his steps. No matter how mistreated or ill-used we may have been, from an imagined slight to sadistic torture and murder, our forgiving directed by Jesus will only be a pale shadow of what he has already done at Calvary. Please remember that all we will be studying the rest of the week rests on the foundation of those words that were uttered from Golgotha's rugged brow, forgive them. Can we pray? Oh Lord, our example, hear our prayer. Touch our hearts so that they're too, so full of mercy and love that they don't have room for a grudge. Touch our minds so that we think more of heavenly blessings than of earthly hurts. 
Touch our eyes that we may see the pain others feel that makes them lash out in inappropriate ways at unfortunate times. Help us that we do not become oversensitive to the insensitivity of others. Touch our emotions so that we don't become just reactive in our dealings in life. Lord, help us that when we are slow to forget, that we can still be quick to forgive and forgive again and again. Dear God of the dysfunctional Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, help us to forgive because we have a major problem. We are human and we are broken. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. We we'll hope you will be with us again tomorrow when we take another look at an aspect of forgiveness. And by the way, is there someone, is there someone you should forgive? Good night. Thank you, Brother Moss, for that powerful message. If you would like more information regarding small groups, partner, in us, partner with us in giving, or submit a prayer request, please visit us at neurogupc.info. I'd like to leave you with this verse, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God bless you and have a wonderful night.